by uh, suburbs of Chicago area. And he decided to see a naturopathic doctor, and um, that doctor really made a big difference in both of our lives, enough so that um, it made me decide to go back to naturopathic medical school. So um, he, my husband went from a person who was taking short-term disability and Family Medical Leave Act to someone that you see in this picture who can hike on the trails with his family. So it was just definitely a special and positive story of recovery. Um, and I knew that I wanted to learn more about this medicine. Uh, and so here I am. Dr. Yanez, you can go ahead and flip the, the channel. Okay, so why naturopathic medicine? Uh, the reason that I specifically chose naturopathic medicine, besides that, uh, the story that I told you already, um, what I really have found and what I was looking for in a degree, I wanted to understand natural medicine and natural approaches better, but I wanted to learn it in a system systemized format. I wanted to understand some of the science behind it, some of the research behind it. Like I really wanted to understand um, why we did what we did. And so what I really believe in and what I used as a sentence here is that naturopathic doctors were able to both integrate the knowledge of modern medical science and traditional healing approach. And that's what really makes our practice special is the ability to use both. So if I would have any tips for future naturopathic doctors at this time, I would say probably two things. One, prior to starting a naturopathic medical program, I would highly recommend, the, recommend optimizing your own health and optimizing your own um, internal healing mechanism. And we talk about that in naturopathic medicine. So really uh, get on the journey to making sure that you're in good, healthy function because it's a, it's a rigorous program and you will be challenged in it. The other recommendation I would have is more of a financial fitness or financial optimization. And that's not always easy if you're um, just uh, graduating from a bachelorette program. But anything that you can do to save uh, money, I would highly recommend because if you're looking at schools, you probably are recognizing that uh, student loans, things can get uh, expensive with all graduate programs. So finding ways to uh, be financially fit is always a recommend, re recommendation no matter what program you join. So those are really my two recommendations as future naturopathic doctors. Uh, go ahead and turn the slide. Okay. So my weekly routine, as you saw in that first picture, my story, you may have noticed two little girls in that picture. So besides being a naturopathic doctor, I'm also a mother of two young children. So um, there's a lot of balance that I have to do in order to be both mom uh, to, young, to, to the young children and build my practice. So I own my own practice in a suburb of Chicago. Uh, the town is called Hoffman Estates. And um, right now I'm working about 25 to 30 hours a week. And that really is a good balance for me and my family. Um, I keep busy enough in the practice. Um, I'm taking a paycheck. And like I said, I am a small business owner. So I, I'm learning all about bookkeeping and accounting and payroll services. I do run my own payroll. Um, so I'm also work on the business aspect as well as the practice as aspect of being a naturopathic doctor. So um, I kind of mentioned that already. So besides um, the business aspect, um, the 25 to 30 hours a week include direct patient care, um, researching cases. I also, as my own small business owner, I do my own marketing. That includes building my website, enhancing it, uh, social media posts, uh, getting flyers out, whatever it is that calls for that week. Returning calls and emails and um, managing the business aspect. My typical work day, um, 
so my work days are split up. I do two eight-hour days and then two four-hour days. Uh, so on either a four or eight-hour day, I'll start my work day by checking all my emails. Um, in my business, what I've done is at this time, I have uh, off-site schedulers. So it's like a virtual reception and scheduling service. Uh, that's a good way, uh, as you're building your business, that's a good way to have um, customer care without the expense of having someone on payroll as receptionist. So they're my virtual reception staff. I communicate with my um, my schedulers then about anything that might have changed overnight in terms of my schedule. I read um, any first office intakes that may have come in for the day. I review charts for the day, make sure that I'm covering everything. Um, then, of course, I do my direct consultations with, uh, with patients. Um, then over, over lunch or breaks, I will typically write my notes. Sometimes I'll sneak a walk in there or something, um, or grab like a cup of tea or something like that. Uh, then when I'm not in direct patient care, I often try to read an article or two a day, finish daily notes, and I may research any questions that may have came up during the day that I had further, uh, that I needed to review in terms of um, improving patient outcomes. So besides that, I'm also a board member of the ILAMP, which is the Illinois Association of Naturopathic Doctors. So I volunteer some time with that uh, when needed. You can go ahead and move the slide. Okay, so let's focus on two of our topics for today. Um, I guess two of the three, one being a day in the life of naturopathic medicine, and then next is um, our back to school nutrition, and then after this we'll talk about uh, the case on eczema. So back to school nutrition, this is very timely as all the kids are now back in school. And as Dr. Yen has said, that um, the cute pictures are coming out all over social media. So it's a lot of fun. So I really just have the two biggest things I can recommend generally to any parent that I talk to is um, eliminate sugar and have a balanced variety of foods. Now I'm going to talk about like this um, balanced variety of foods and everything with saying that um, you know I see children that have different food sensitivities or need different food elimination diets so I'm speaking very broadly right now um, and basically ignoring any specific food sensitivity or food elimination diet that someone may be on because obviously that's more of a clinical approach and I'm giving general recommendations. So, but no matter who I speak to, um, I highly recommend always to be a whole food based diet. And that really means as whole as possible, as close to nature, as close to source as possible, then you really know that you're getting good nutrition. And I'm sorry, but um, somehow the webinar popped out. Somehow I lost the slides. Okay, we're, um, I'm still on the slide. I've got the back to school nutrition slide right here up. Um, so eliminating sugar from lunches. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm not seeing it, but I'll keep talking because I have my notes in front of me. Okay. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so in terms of eliminating sugar, I, so, I mean, we hear this all the time, but why, why do practitioners say that we need to eliminate sugar and why should that be eliminated from lunches? Sugar depletes your immune system. There is so many research articles that talks about how sugar depletes um, specifically, and I'll get into the terminology that you'll learn as a naturopathic doctor, but specifically it depletes phagocytic activity of your neutrophils, and your neutrophils are your fighter cells when you're exposed to a virus or exposed to you know um, anything going on with your immune system. So really, you know, we get, we have to get sugar out of lunches. And honestly, if you start reading packages, you're going to see that sugar is in just about everything. Even like the natural-based uh, processed foods, 
it's amazing and both alarming, like the organic cane sugar, the organic cane juice. I mean, all the names of sugar pops up, and it's just uh, not. It, it's all still sugar, and that does deplete the immune system. So really start reading labels and make sure that the pr products that you're purchasing for your children don't have that sugar in them. My next recommendation would be allow children to pick their own foods. Um, and basically, uh, picking their own foods from a list will provide some autonomy, but still a little bit of parental control in terms of uh, what foods you want your children to eat. So um, a good rule of thumb, and I ha actually had a family member recommend this to me, and I thought it was a great idea, um, I'll create a list um, for a section with protein, a, se a section for a starch or a grain, a section for fats, a section for fruit, and a, and a section for vegetables. And then make a list of all the foods that either your family typically eats or um, that you'd like your child to eat or that your child enjoys. Um, and have your child pick one from each category. So proteins may include things like um, organic chicken breast, it could include uh, like an organic uh, free range uh, organic turkey lunch meat, lentils, chickpeas, um, just anything in the protein category. So they'll pick one of those. Then the next, so uh, focusing more on the whole food based nutrition, picking a starch or, or grain. Um, I really like. Uh, things like organic sprouted ancient grain breads those are pretty close to a whole like uh, as pretty close it's still slightly processed but if you're going to pick a bread that's a pretty good bread to pick for making sandwiches um, I wrote down crackers but I was being pretty specific when I wrote that down there are crackers on the market that are um, really whole food based that may have flaxseed in it or um, just like uh, different whole grains, quinoa, very minimally processed. Uh, that's something my children eat. They'll typically, like a snack, is like this super whole food based cracker combination with hummus or a dipping, some sort of dip. Um, also, you could do sprouted wraps. There's sprouted wraps on the market, sweet potatoes, potatoes as a starch, quinoa, rice. Uh, there's, you know, I listed just a few for space, but there's plenty of um, opportunities to pick from and options, I should say. Fats, of course, would be hummus, avocado, seeds, grass-fed, um, organic, or goat's cheese. And, um, you know, I wrote down nut butters. Obviously, with all the nut allergies, you have to be cautious about that. But um, so it depends on the school and your child and um, the rules and restrictions. But if that's not an issue, then that would be one of the op uh, options would be to do um, a type of nut butter too as part of the lunch. Veggies can be anything from cooked veggies, vegetables and soup, cucumber slices, celery, celery, Salads, sorry, celery, salads, carrot sticks, um, or even combinations. We, uh, one of my children's new favorite snack is ants on a log. So it's just, you know, the old school celery with a little bit of um, all natural peanut butter and a couple of raisins, and we're done. And I got them to eat some vegetables. So um, another thing my kids really enjoy is uh, a veggie soup with some sort of protein in it sometimes lentils, like right now we have a lentil quinoa soup um, simmering in the crock pot for lunch today. Um, so any types of those combinations and things that you can do um, to enhance your child's nutrition is always helpful. Okay, you can go ahead and turn the slide. Go for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so a case on pediatric eczema. This was really a, a great case. Um, I happen to see a lot of children uh, that have come in with a diagnosis of eczema in my practice. Um, actually some adults too and um, it's actually very rewarding when I see a case like this because 
this is a place where you know you can see the effects of naturopathic medicine visually, and it's pretty profound. Um, I believe that on your screen you are seeing a, the before and after pictures of baby M. So, um, like I said, this is one of many cases, and um, it's always great results here. So, baby M, um, I actually saw her. Uh, right around the first time I saw her, she was just six months old, and uh, baby M was only being breastfed at the time. And if you look at that picture on the left, you can see the eczema on her um, on her cheeks. She also had eczema on both of her thumbs, her bilateral thumbs, and um, she also had a black tear duct. Uh, that if that wasn't uh, if that blockage was not going to go away, um, it would have had to be um, surgically fixed. So baby M, like I said, came to me with her mom, and her mom actually happens to be a client of mine also. So um, I'm working with baby and mom kind of as a dyad, especially when you're dealing with a breastfed baby. You have to look at the connection between mom and baby, and what mom is eating can impact baby. and that's one of the situations that happened here. So um, baby M, what we did with her, when she was, like I said, she was first being breastfed, so we had to do most of our therapy, a majority of the therapeutic started through mom and through her breast, breast milk that was then you know, fed to baby M. So what we did initially was test mom, or, or we had testing done um, to look at food sensitivities of moms. So uh, ELISA, IDG, IGA, food testing, a food panel was run on mom. And um, we, we were able to find or identify what foods were causing an inflammatory effect. And basically, those inflammatory factors were getting dumped into the breast milk and causing this um, skin eczema irritation to baby M. So um, that was the first step. So we had mom eliminate those inflammatory foods from her diet. And then um, uh, before baby M was really consuming solids, I put mom on a high dose probiotic. And we also gave mom cod liver oil and um, vitamin D was also checked. And that was low. So um, uh, she supplemented with a vitamin D. Then we used what's uh, called Similisen, which is actually a product name. Um, I have no affiliation with this, but it's Similisen homeopathic eye drops to use for the black tear duct. Um, for the black tear duct, we also incorporated gentle massage uh, near the duct. And also, this is a really interesting note, um, a little take home or pearl that you can apply breast milk to a black cure doc too. And breast milk has natural um, uh, mucolytic or uh, mucus breakdown properties in it. So that helped to break down um, some of the blockage in the tear duct. And I actually also had mom apply breast milk to baby M's cheeks as part of the therapeutics as an external approach for the same reason. And I know this probably sounds Whoa, what is she talking about? But it's true. Um, uh, a lot of moms apply breast milk on babies for wounds um, and for healing because of all the healing properties of breast milk. Um, also topical that we applied to work on the eczema besides the breast milk, we also utilize coconut oil to kind of uh, just keep, keep the area covered while we're working through this, and a healing salve with a uh, with a botanical of calendula in it. Um, we also really had to be cautious and monitor for a condition called impetigo. And impetigo is basically a secondary staph infection that can happen with uh, people with eczema. Um, and it could be serious. It can cause cellulitis. It can get into the bloodstream. So we were always um, really being cautious and keeping an eye on that. Um, once baby M started, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'll back up a moment. Besides, uh, at, 
so that was the first set of treatment approach the, that I just discussed. Then we also added homeopathy directly uh, to baby M. So we used homeopathic sulfur at a 6C potency because uh, homeopathic sulfur fit the case for uh, the itchy, itchy skin that was worse with warm water and worse at night. She was constantly trying to scratch, scratch her face at night while she was sleeping. Uh, once foods were introduced, to baby M's diet, then we started uh, also adding uh, small amounts of probiotic. Uh, we added a small amount of cod liver oil to her diet, and that was dosed um, appropriately for her age and size. And um, besides, then, so from homeopathic sulfur, um, we switched the remedies a few times. We went to graphitis for a little while, um, and then we went back to, uh, we ended back on homeopathic sulfur for a while. And um, as you can see in the pictures, it's a before and after case, um, but there was a lot of in between. So <laughs> well, the mom would send me pictures. Things would clear up, then things would get a little bad again, and then we were, you know, changing the homeopathic remedy or, you know, um, restarting the homeopathic remedy and things would clear up and they'd flare and then ultimately though at the end you can see this is actually a picture of baby M. She has been clear for a while now. I think I want to say it's been, she's about 20 months old now so um, I think it's been about five or six months that she's had very very um, clear skin and no signs of eczema. So really neat case. Um, now I'm basically following the family or baby M mainly for wellness and for um, just immune boosting um, during the seasons because she's a younger child. You can go ahead and turn the slide. Okay, so tips for practice success. Um, so, at, like I mentioned before, um, being both a busy small business owner, um, a practitioner, and a mom of young children, it truly is all about work-life balance. I know that sounds cliche, but it is. And I kind of feel, honestly, that I probably have the closest to work-life balance that I'm able to achieve at this time. Um, for me, it's, you know, having all these roles in my life right now, one of the things that I really uh, can respect is that I also have to take care of myself. And it, everybody is going to have a different outlet, but you need to make sure that you have some sort of outlet. And it's okay to have an outlet because you're going to be taking care of a lot of people. You're going to be helping a lot of people, and you're going to hear a lot of stories that may be sad. Um, you know, there's going to be days that um, are going to be hard days, and you're going to also have days that are going to be victories. Um, I really love my career. I'm really pleased with it. But I know that one of the biggest things for me as both mom and as a practitioner and small business owner is that I also have to take care of myself. So for me, it's things like going hunting, running, exercising, hanging out with my kids, being silly, playing, whatever that is for you. If it's you know, yoga, dancing, surfing, whatever it is, you just need to have that outlet. It's really, really important. Um, and it's okay. It's not at all selfish. Um, I would say also to really find joy in your work life. Even the mundane tasks. Try to find a way or appreciation of the joy. Or You mean like charting? What's that? Like charting? Like charting, yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Charting. Well, for me, okay, yeah, charting. <laughs> right, charting can take forever sometimes, and it's you just have to do it. And I think. Um, but I, I noticed, I noticed something about your day though that was really important. And you did your charting, you know, pretty soon after you saw the patient, either during yes. the visit or during lunch and breaks and such, so that. You know, one of the things that I'll see with colleagues is, you know, they've got a pile of charts at the end of the day when they're tired, and now it just becomes this big chore. Right. 
And it's, oh, it's yeah. really, you know, your habit of doing that as you go is really a fabulous one. It, I kind of liken it to cooking. Like when you're, when you're right. cooking a beautiful meal, uh, one of my uncles was a, a chef and he always said, clean as you go along, because after you've enjoyed your beautiful meal, the last thing you want to do is take a look at a, a sink full of dishes. Mm. And charting mm-hmm. is kind of that similar thing. You've enjoyed right. your patience and now you've got all this yeah. work ahead of you. So um, right. thank you so, so much for, uh, you know, for this talk today. I really appreciate um, the time that you spent. We're, we're starting to see some questions popping up here. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a few more slides here. My apologies. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. In terms of charting, yeah, that was something I learned, honestly, as a new mom, that w- that's one of my biggest stress relievers. I cannot handle having charts sitting there o- uh, like overnight. I have to get all my charting done when, I- when I'm done seeing patients. Like either, you know, on my breaks, lunch breaks, during the appointment, my patients know that I type you know, type things up as we go. I also give them summaries. Um, so all my charting is electronic, and I give them summaries that summarize our visit, and that shoots through electronically through like a HIPAA protected password protected portal. And I'm just, <laughs> that is just one thing that I'm very meticulous about because they're waiting for their summary. They're be- waiting for um, what I said, their recommendations. They want them in written form. So I'm really particular about getting my charting done fast, as fast as I can. Um, and that's just something that I learned because actually, truly, from my last job that I let charting pile up, and it's not fun. Um, so other than that, looking forward, my personal goals is to continue to grow my practice to add employees and assistants, expand my physical space. Um, I want to continue to teach the community the benefits of naturopathic medicine. Um, Even this is part of that. Um, And I feel like the goals for the naturopathic medical profession is to continue to gain acceptance and licensure in all 50 states. Um, I even feel like that's even our mission here in Illinois. And I'm really proud and pleased to be part of uh, the board of ILAMP to see that happen here and that we should continue to be recognized as the experts in naturopathic medicine or in natural medicine because we really are. Um, So that's really my presentation for today. Thank you so, so much for for your time here. Um, Before we turn it over to questions, I just wanted to let folks know uh, AANMC has uh, an events page on our website and we've got a number of upcoming events uh, that, uh, you're more than welcome to. They're all free events for, uh, prospective students or people interested in this career. Uh, we will be part of health professions week at the end of September, uh, and have a bunch of information up on our website, all about that. Uh, so there'll be two webinars that you can find out about naturopathic medicine there. Uh, we'll also have a webinar next month, uh, again, kind of continuing on pediatrics with, uh, Dr. Jared Scarron. And he'll be talking more about ADHD and autism uh, and naturopathic approaches there. So if you have interest or know folks, uh, please let them know about our webinar. Uh, So with that, I'm going to turn it over to some questions. So there were a bunch of questions about baby M. Uh, Let's see. Uh, So folks were, were curious about the types of foods that she was reacting to and how you figured that out. Okay. So baby M, like I said, um, she started out being a breastfed baby, and so she was only getting breast milk initially. So for mom, we did uh, what's called the ELISA IgG IgA food uh, sensitivity testing. So it looks at uh, delayed onset basic delayed onset food allergies. It's looking at IgG. So that's immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin A, um, which is different parts of your immune system. Um, and it can show up as basic their inflammatory factors uh, that these foods are causing inflammation. So mom, actually, she had a lot. Um, like I mentioned before, mom is also a client of mine, so we're working on some other things with her. But she was really reacting to a lot of food, which meant she was dumping all those inflammatory, like she was dumping inflammation, inflammatory factors into that, into the breast milk. So the foods, I mean, it was a lot more than, um, 
you would have possibly found on, el on an elimination diet. So that's why testing like that was probably helpful. So really, uh, even in naturopathic medical school, I was taught that the elimination diet is gold standard, and then any of these types of uh, functional lab testing is kind of like a silver, silver medal. Um, and I still agree with that. I really like getting people on an, on an elimination diet and then challenge them and see uh, what foods uh, might be causing an issue. However, with this testing, it was interesting. Things like even rice was showing up. Um, she was reacting to rice. She was reacting to all grains. She ended up basically going on somewhat of a modified paleo diet. She was even reacting to almonds. And we took it out of, so the, the testing showed that. And we went ahead and took it out of our diet. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned during the presentation, you know, that there was, um, we kept seeing improvements, kept seeing improvements. And I do think it was a combination of both diet and homeopathy, truly. Um, and then adding a couple of other uh, nutraceuticals to support us on our, on our little road of recovery here. But, um, so besides just what the test showed, we did try to reintroduce those foods back to see if, you know, gold standard, is it really that food? And she would tell me, you know, I can tell when I eat rice that it impacts me. It's like rice is typically um, super, t is tolerated so well, but for this mom, it was not working for her. And same with almonds, she could tell right away if she ate almonds that she was having a problem with them. So um, that's kind of the approach that we, we took. Uh, there was another question about um, follow through and how often you were seeing BBM during the, you know, the active phase. Well, um, I missed the last part. Follow through and BBM uh, during the active component of when she was really flared up. Okay, um, they were really, they're really, really good patients, and they had, they were extremely. Um, proactive in BBM's recovery. So um, typically, we were, I was seeing her about once a month. But if she had a flare-up, mom was really good about having her come in right away. So, um, and then we would address it head on. So it was about every, I would say on average, it was about once a month, thinking about it. And then we'd have, when things were getting really clear for BBM, then of course we spread out the appointments and then it was kind of an, on an as needed basis. So. Okay, there were a couple of questions here. Um, so one question about uh, immune deficiency and the connection between allergies and immunity and toxic load. And can you speak to that a bit? Immune deficiency allergies toxic load yes okay um well so i'm a little confused about the immune deficiency part like is there like well the, there was just a question about immunity uh, oh. and uh and toxic oh, load okay. and, and okay, allergies okay. right right okay so i mean the and we actually, so toxic load is a concept that we learn in naturopathic medicine and in environmental medicine, which is great. And if someone's really interested in learning more about toxic load in environmental medicine, I really like Dr. Crinion's body of work. Um, we learned a lot from him. I think Dr. Yanez, you probably did too. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm dating myself. I, I, I did that back in, uh, when I was a resident in 2000. Oh, wow. so. <laughs> yeah, he's like the expert on tox, I feel like, on environmental medicine and toxic load. But yes, yeah, so that's a really big subject. But to break it down, like, yeah, there are so many things that can contribute to toxic load. Our environment, the chemicals in our environment, plastics, the food that we eat, the um, xenobiotics, the estrogens, the, like the estrogens in the plastic, the stuff in our, you know, what's in our water, um, 
uh, chlorine in our water, you know, everything, heavy, you know, people are getting exposed to heavy metals. Even when you eat things with organic origin, they're finding arsenic in it and heavy metals. So that all contributes to the toxic load. So, um, and then, yes, yeah, so there is an association between toxic load and causing either allergies or chronic illness or, um, you know, all of the gamut of things that you may see as a naturopathic doctor. So, yes, yeah, so there's definitely a connection, and it's kind of like if you visualize like you have a barrel and you just keep filling that barrel with all the things that I mentioned, then it just starts to overflow and you'll have these symptoms. So some people it shows up as allergies, some people it shows up as eczema, it may show up as joint pain, inflammation, headaches, migraines, chronic illness, all of the above. So okay, I hope so that helps. Yes, thank you. So we have a few questions about topicals. Um, so folks are asking, uh, you know, a lot of times eczema is accompanied by dry skin, uh, yes. and, and so there, there are a number of questions here about, you know, coconut oil versus things like Aveeno and oatmeal baths oh, okay. and, and, you know, okay. what, what you would say about the, I know you talked a little bit about some topicals and not everybody has access to breast milk. So that's not something okay. that, <laughs> um, yeah. that, that, that not everyone can, can do. Um, and the other thing about breast milk too, that, uh, I heard in your lecture and, um, is also that it's it's a source of fats. It's very high in fat, and so mm -hmm. that it's it's a natural moisturizer in addition to the uh, the immune uh, immune component. But in in right. light of in light of that, that that's a limited sure. supply for most. Um, can you talk a little bit about some topicals uh, for sure. the skin? Thank you. So personally, I am not a fan of Aveeno. Um, back to toxic load um, and our environmental medicine background. Um, early, very, very, even before I became a naturopathic doctor, that was probably one of my biggest interests was things like what are you feeding your skin, what's in our skin products, and I just went like kind of on a witch hunt with all my skin products looking for parabens and oh like uh, glycols and I, you know, it's been, that was such a long time ago. But, um, you know, if you look at EWG, Environmental Working Group, there's a list of things you should stay away from in your topicals. So, um, you know, when a parent comes in with a vino, I typically say, let's get away from the vino. Um, my preference is to do um, more holistic-based salves that don't have things like the parabens in it that are naturally based. Um, anything that is like as close to nature as you can come, that's kind of where my interest lies. So um, we picked a salve, um, and actually, you can find these over the over the counter, and actually fairly easily. Um, and this one had uh, calendula in it, and it had um, I think there was olive oil. But the main ingredient I was looking for was calendula, because calendula is very healing, and that's something uh, we, we study a lot in naturopathic medicine, is how calendula can heal skin conditions. Um, so there's different, you know, depending on the naturopath, naturopathic providers, some people make their own salves. Um, and I know parents that I see that make their own salves at home. And um, I, you know, I don't, so we went with something simple that you can get at um, some local local places, and it worked really well, and it's all natural, so um, we like that, and then uh, just straight up coconut oil. Now, I have to say coconut oil, that worked for this patient, but I've had other people with eczema that react to coconut oil, so, you know, it's all person-specific, so one person does great with coconut oil, and another little girl, it's just not going to work for. Her. Yeah, they may need cocoa butter or coconut oil or uh, or not coconut oil, shea, shea butter, uh, shea, or some other right. you know other naturally derived uh, oil sources. Um, I've even seen folks with like really bad throwing some castor oil on top of them. Now castor oil is sticky and gooey, right? Um, yeah, but, but yeah, there there are lots of different you know depending on how reactive you are and what you're reacting to. Uh, so now right. there's another question here 
Um, so one question about the elimination diet that you talked about and how long before reintroducing uh, some of the offenders, or do you ever reintroduce? Great question. And those are really good questions. So elimination diet, this, we typically like to say uh, four to six weeks um, to really get that food out of your system. And then um, it depends. Once again, it's all patient-specific. This medicine is really patient-specific. And, um, you know, we have some protocols, but we also, you know, are very... Uh, clinic base, you know, and clinical experience base. So some people know right away, they can tell, they feel so much better if they're gluten-free, dairy-free, almond-free, that they don't want to reintroduce that food. Um, then other people, yeah, will bring it back in after four to six weeks, wash out, and see if it makes a difference. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, there were some questions about healthy recipes because you talked about a lot about diet changes and do you have any favorites websites or books that you refer folks to uh, for for nutrition? Yeah, let's hopefully I you know I have it written out. I give patients handouts at my visits, so um, I want to say Nourishing Meals is one of the websites that I recommend. Um, I think that's what it's called. Um, so sorry, don't quote me on it. Um, recipes. I am a huge fan of my crock pot. Some people, um, you know, I kind of network with other providers and they like Instapot. I haven't really got, joined that group. Um, I've actually even had my crock pot tested for lead and it did not contain any lead. So I know that's been a concern for people. Um, once, that, once again, looking at the environmental medicine perspective. So I do a lot of bulk crockpot cooking, particularly for children's lunches. Um, so I do a lot of things like, like today I said lentils. I do lentils and quinoa with a vegetable broth, and then we add some spices. Sometimes we add um, carrots and celery to the mix, and you just cook it uh, for eight hours and you're ready to go. Um, we do sometimes like chicken vegetable soups with a lot of spices again and and maybe some sea salt, cook that out. Um, I'm kind of one of those, a splash of this and a pinch of that kind of people. But um, yeah, I know, and I mean, we're working parents too, so I understand that aspect of it too. So I kind of heavily rely on my crock pot, particularly for um, lunches. So what I do is make kind of a bulk, that's what I have cooking right now. I make a bulk thing of, um, like to, like this week is kind of like the lentil quinoa blend and then that's basically a complete protein with some starch in it and we put it in thermos with soup containers and that keeps it warm if the children are going to childcare for the day. So it doesn't need to be heated, heated up, reheated, anything. Um, it stays hot the whole time. Um, I know that there are a number of naturopathic doctors out there that have websites uh, focused on nutrition as well. Um, Dr. Damon Jones. So AANMC just uh, put out a, a newsletter this morning um, for those of you who are signed up for our newsletter. And we featured Dr. Damon Jones, who has done, uh, who has written some books on healthy, uh, healthy mm. recipes. Uh, using whole foods. And so I know that there are a lot of options out there. Um, but really, I think in general, if you're searching for whole foods types of recipes, um, and more than anything, reading the label when you go shopping, yeah. um, you know, yeah. I've, I've given, I've given talks on nutrition and, you know, most of the talk is just Focus it, you know, focusing folks' attention on the need to read your labels and know what's in your food, uh, because so often there are things in there hiding that you have no idea, uh, maybe you know, inflaming the skin or causing problems. And so, you know, the nice thing about a whole foods diet is you don't have labels to read because you're eating the whole food. Um, but if you do have anything from a box or a can, uh, you know, or anything in the package, really reading every single label. Uh, is very, very vital to make sure that you're not getting anything that you wouldn't want to be eating. Right. And, and so, I guess as a, oh, yeah, I mean, 
I buy a lot of bulk, like bulk lentils, bulk chickpeas, bulk quinoa, bulk, bulk um, brown rice. And yeah, because it's really, really whole food based, not too expensive either. And you can mix and match, <laughs> kind of like I talked in, in the, um, during the slide presentation. Okay, um, we had one question. Um, I normally, just because the ANMC does not endorse any specific products, we've got some questions mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, types of probiotics and uh, oh, the, okay. the comp and the company that you use for your um, uh, for the virtual office assistant. We typically okay. don't uh, comment specifically on on types of products because we don't endorse anything. Um, but you know, if, if you'd like to contact us offline, we, we'd be happy to uh, to connect you with with some resources. Okay. Yeah. So the, there were just a few questions about that. Um, so with okay. that, I'm seeing. Uh, let's see. I'm seeing a few more questions just popped up. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so you talked about um, the mom of baby M was reacting to rice. There was a question: Was that brown rice, mm -hmm. or um, and does it matter sometimes? Like with with food reactivity, I think there's you know there's a lot. Um, what I've seen you know from years in practice, and I'm sure you have as well. There there's a lot around food reaction that sometimes folks will react to, to one type of food and not another, um, and it's really a trial and error. But I think the beautiful thing you've talked about today with eczema that, you know, eczema is one of those kind of really rewarding things to see because when somebody clears up, it's visible very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, years yeah. ago, I had, I had a patient who um, was sensitive to wheat and gluten. And, uh, you know, after work, he would unwind, he'd have a beer. Well, hey, guess what? What what's what's beer made from? Does anybody know? I know that you can't speak, but um, beer is is derived from wheat products, and so little did he know that you know he was trying to be good and, and not eat things that would flare up his eczema. But the beer a after you know unwinding at the end of his workday was totally wreaking havoc in his system, and so uh, we you know we cut out the alcohol for a bit. And he saw that his skin cleared up, and it's it's amazing when it happens. And so I think mm -hmm. you know, for folks in general, like I've got a lot of questions here about you know foods and oh well you know we've got some dry skin and some eczema and things of that sort. And it's it's what you were talking about earlier that it's really an investigation into your right. health and um, you know figuring out the individual. And that's the beauty of naturopathic medicine is we focus on the individual. So it isn't just hey put this cream on your skin and you know come back. It's, Hey, let's find right. the, root, the root of the cause because the roots in the gut and it's what you're eating. Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's well, find the root here. Go for it. Right. Right. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. true. And, and this mom, I don't, hopefully that this, this could be a whole other topic, but you know, mom, we identified really had some leaky gut issues in her set in another cell. Um, like I said, that's a whole other can of worms kind of situation. Um, but yes, it's it's so individual. Um, not obviously, not everyone's going to react to rice. That's actually, I think she's one of my only patients that have a true reaction to rice at this point. So um, yeah, it, for her, it was all rice. But um, it's it's individualized medicine, truly, because I've seen many other eczema cases, and it wasn't gluten or rice. So you know, everybody truly has. Um, kind of a different biological blueprint. So it's just like, and I guess that's the, uh, that is the beauty of our medicine, and that's what naturopathic doctors do. Um, you know, you'll learn about our, our theoretical model and that, you know, tole causum means find the cause, and, you know, uh, yeah, via doceri, which means doctor is teacher, and I, I feel pretty confident that I, I use all of the kind of the things that we learn theoretically in school in my practice. So, well, with that, I think we're going to close up the webinar here. Uh, thank you all so much for attending and spending an hour of your day with us here at the AMC and Dr. Uh, Forsman Landers. 
And uh, we'll, as I said earlier, we'll be posting this webinar up on the website for a and uh, in the near future. And uh, please, I hope that you can join us again for one of our upcoming webinars. Again, we're, next month we'll have uh, a topic with Dr. Jared Scarin out of Connecticut on uh, autism and ADHD. And, uh, and that's going to be really exciting and interesting. And then we'll also be uh, hosting some virtual fairs this month and in November. So again, thank you so much all for attending and spending your time with us. And we hope to, to see you on a webinar again soon. Thank you, Dr. Right. Doctor, so much for your time as well. And give those kiddos a hug for me. They're adorable. Right. right. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. I will be staying on for some questions if there are any additional questions. Thanks so much.